So welcome to another edition of Monday Morning Live, the uh, podcast, the webinar, the Facebook live stream, all the, all the things. I am Matt Bach, Director of Communications with the Michigan Municipal League. And today, uh, once again, I'm joined uh, by the uh, Lansing staff uh, for my screen, uh, counterclockwise, I guess, Jennifer Rigtering, Harrisana Richards, Chris Hackbarth, and John Lamakia. And we have Betsy on standby uh, fielding your questions. If you do have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box right here, or you can post them on the, the Facebook live feed and we'll answer them as, as they come in the best we can. So just want to get everyone uh, started off here. Uh, let's talk about the state budget stuff. A lot of things happened last week with the uh, Senate and House in session. Uh, so Chris, if you could just kind of kick things off and, and give us the highlights uh, of the issues that impacted the cities, our, our members, cities and villages and urban townships the most. Absolutely, Matt. So we had um, the, the deal that has been talked about for a while. Uh, we've had some information up on our Inside 2-Way blog. Uh, they put that together this last week. Uh, was in the general fund portion of the deal was in House Bill 5265. And essentially the, the main impact for uh, local government, this is the state's current year budget. They had, remember they had a $3 billion hole in the current year budget between school aid and general fund. So they closed up uh, that using, you know, some, some rainy day fund dollars um, and using the, most of the rest of the federal money that they got in CARES Act. Uh, and they plugged those into different places. Uh, as we had uh, talked about with, uh, with, um, the use of CARES dollars in Senate Bill 690, the prior supplemental, where they had the hazard pay and the payroll reimbursement for public safety. You saw the state utilizing in this bill that passed last week, you saw the state using some of those dollars to cover their state police and corrections payroll costs. Quite a big chunk of those, of those cuts uh, from general fund were then replaced with, uh, with CARES dollars. They also did, as we've talked about, they did take $97 million from the August revenue sharing payments, statutory payments for cities, villages, townships, and counties. Roughly 43 million of that uh, came out of cities, villages, and townships. The rest was counties. And uh, they're then replacing that with $150 million of CARES funding that will be issued proportionally, it'll be an automatic distribution proportionally uh, to every local unit based upon what they would have received in their August payment. So if you were set to receive an August CBTRS payment of $100,000, you should expect somewhere in the neighborhood of $150,000 uh, coming in CARES money. Uh, and that will be automatic. Which if you don't have a time frame on that, the governor has not signed this bill yet. It hasn't even been presented to her. We expect that to happen early this week. Uh, and then she'll have some time to sign it. We hope she signs it by the end of this week, early next week. And then those dollars uh, will then, we'll have some information from Treasury at that point on their plan for distribution. But I've been told to expect it, community should expect it around the same time as what they would have received their August revenue sharing payment, normal revenue sharing payment, and uh, that they will not have to apply for it. It'll be an automatic distribution and communities will be able to accrue it back to their prior fiscal year if they need to. So those are some things that were written into the language. So, so your feeling is that the, the, the money's gonna come around the same time. So you shouldn't have much of a, hopefully you won't have a cash flow issue. If you're going, you know, check to check, I guess. Um, you, this should be around the same time is what I'm hearing, right? Right. I mean, it will still be, these replacement dollars are the federal CARES dollars. So they are still limited to the same types of uses that we've been talking about. Um, but you know, you'll be able to use it for public safety payroll. You'll be able to use it for, uh, you know, if you have FEMA match, uh, that's an allowable expense. Uh, if you have other costs that weren't covered by FEMA, other over, or sorry, other costs that weren't covered uh, under your FEMA expenses previously, if you've got overtime costs, I know we had a lot of conversations about public health and public safety payroll. What about public works employees, water sewer department employees? So some of those uh, expenses that you can directly tie to COVID, you will be able to use those as you would any other federal CARES expense. Okay. So if there's if there's um, so if there's overage and you don't normally let's say you get a hundred thousand in your example, you get one hundred fifty thousand. What do you do with that extra fifty if you're used to having a set amount for those different expenses? Is there options that you can spend that, that kind of stuff on or? Well, again, as we talked about with, like with the public safety payroll expense, uh, you will be able to through, 
believed its eligibility is spending through the end of 2020, uh, you could apply public safety or public health payroll expenses back to those to this hundred in this case this example one hundred fifty thousand okay. dollars. So, so then it, I, it's so yeah. a concept if you're putting that money that fifty thousand toward you know November December payroll, then you could use that November December payroll on other things that you may be needed it on. Correct. Okay. You know, if you've had physical plant changes you've had to make, you know, you've had to get more PPE for employees, you've had to change the structure of your workstations, you know, all those types of expenses that you can trace back to COVID should be eligible expenses. We're waiting on exact guidance from Treasury, but they're going to be following U.S. Treasury guidance. So definitely members uh, who are tuned in now can start pulling up and kind of combing through the eligible expenses that U.S. Treasury Department has put out uh, under their web pages, and those are all available on the league's coronavirus resource page and on Treasury's coronavirus resource page. Okay, good. We did get one question uh, regarding this. Uh, when is the August September revenue estimating conference? Do we know? We don't have a date yet. It is likely going to be the third or fourth week of August, but they have not scheduled it. It will be in August, though late August. Which means, I guess, from that, that the following question is. They'll use that then to build their fiscal year 21 uh, state budget. So we won't see a state budget and know what their plans are for revenue sharing from October 1st on until sometime mid to late September, uh, right before the state's October 1 fiscal year deadline. Okay. And a related question from the same person. What is happening with the CARES Act program for utility customer assistance? So those dollars, we have to do some follow-up with DHHS. Um, it, certainly, if you had an opportunity to tune in to the webinar or pull down the recording when we had DHHS employees on, um, when was that, Matt? Three weeks ago, we had that big yeah, webinar. I think so. Yeah. Uh, so we can post the link to that again. But you know, that was the first round of information we were given from uh, the department on those water system assistance dollars, and we have been expecting more guidance. Haven't heard more. Uh, Regarding the other six uh, programs in 690, there is still, we've been having a conversation with members about uh, what do I do on hazard pay if I, um, if I don't have the cash to pay it. And Treasury has said they will have an additional application form that you will submit uh, and they will be able then to get the dollars to you before you pay it out. That application form is not complete yet. I followed up with Treasury this morning. They're still working on that, but expect to get it out shortly. But your initial application is all you need. The application form that's out there now is all you need to hold your place in line, so to speak. Uh, and then you will have a second application form that will deal with getting the money before paying it out as opposed to a reimbursement. Okay, uh, just a couple other related questions to this. Uh, would the August distribution need to be tracked as a federal grant contribution and count toward the single audit threshold of 750,000? I don't know what a lot of that means, but I'm hoping you guys do. <laughs> and those are the types of questions that we'll be working with Treasury on. Again, the, the bill hasn't even been presented to the governor yet. It hasn't been signed. Uh, as soon as it's signed, Treasury, I know I had conversations with their staff this morning. They're working right now on some of that guidance to be ready for it to launch as soon as the governor signs. Okay. And the other question on that is, should there be a fiscal tracking of how this 150% is spent? My guess is, again, this is all forthcoming yet from Treasury, but there will be some sort of accounting that communities will need to be ready for uh, to ensure proper eligibility so that the state knows that they've been spent on, on proper expenses. I don't have an answer for that, though, directly, so that's just my gut. Um, so again, we're going to have to wait on that until we hear from Treasury. I do know on the front end, though, that there is no application, at least I've been told, uh, that there is no application for these funds, that they will be sent out in proportion to what you would have received uh, in August normal. Okay. All right. Uh, one other uh, state thing I wanted to bring up, uh, and then before we move to the federal stuff with John, was the um, virtual meetings executive order. Uh, I don't know who wants to jump in on that, but uh, I believe uh, Governor Whitmer did extend that uh, virtual meetings order, so allowing our councils to still uh, meet remotely. Uh, what, what's the latest on that? Anybody can chime in? Yeah, I can, I can talk a little bit about that, Matt. Um, you know, as, as many of our members have, have gone to this virtual meeting platform, the questions about when's it going to be extended again, when's it going to be extended again, keep coming up. 
And so the governor did extend it again here about a week ago, but did something a little different than she had done previously, where in all the previous iterations of this, she had picked a hard date as to when that would end. In this case, she has now tied that to her emergency declaration. So some of those same questions will still apply, right? When will she be extending uh, the emergency? Uh, at what point does that, that emergency come to an end? Uh, currently, based on her executive orders, that emergency will last through August 11th. Now, my very honest answer to you, and Chris just talked about speaking with, with his gut, and, and I'll do a little bit of that when I talk about some of the federal stuff. There is no way, in my opinion, that I see the governor not extending the emergency past August 11th. And quite frankly, I think we can see scenarios based on the way the numbers are tracking right now that, that her emergency declaration, unless the court comes in and suggests she does not have the authority uh, in which she's utilizing right now, could extend well past September, October, and maybe even into November and December, depending on how this happens. Obviously, we can't predict that uh, with any certainty, but I think what we do know is for the foreseeable future, uh, she will be extending those emergencies and it is very likely that for the coming months, we will be able to meet virtually uh, at, at the local level. Okay, good. Um, do have a couple other questions. Uh, will the moratorium on evictions be considered for extension? That was from Facebook. Yeah, I can uh, go ahead and Jen. Oh, I was just going to pipe in and say there the state launched um, their new eviction diversion plan and program that's being run through MISHTA working hand in hand with DHHS. And so I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that program. We can put that a link to it. I can put that in the chat. Um, but John, maybe you can pipe in with recent conversations with the governor's office because it was my understanding once that program launched. Um, they were hoping for folks to take advantage of working with that program. And, and I will mention also that we are having a webinar on this very topic on August 5th. I believe it's at noon. We just got that confirmed today. It's not on our website yet, but we're having an official from MISCHA uh, to talk about that program that Jen just uh, alluded to, the eviction and foreclosure prevention program. Go ahead, John. Yeah, all I was going to say uh, is that from the state level, I, I haven't heard much, but as a little bit of transition to the federal talk, um, you know, some of the news coming out of Washington, D.C. this weekend has been to address that topic very directly and continue uh, the federal extension uh, or the federal moratorium through an extension in this next uh, stimulus package, uh, whenever that, that may happen. So it is a topic both here in, in Michigan based on the, the issue that Jen talked about and some of the information there, but also what's going on at the federal level. Okay, good. Uh, the other question is, uh, what is the latest on SB 943? I don't know what that is. Hopefully one of you. That's another one of the ones I know we want to talk about, Matt. That's the summer tax deferral legislation. Okay. So for members, uh, remember we had two pieces of legislation that the governor did veto. Uh, we have been heavily engaged in those. Uh, would have allowed a, a deferral, a new deferral of summer taxes. And in return, uh, the state was going to provide funding that county treasurers would have passed through as sort of an advance payment, an advance settlement, if you will, to all the local units and schools on, uh, in, early in the fall. The governor vetoed that legislation over a number of concerns, some technical issues that came up, technical constitutional questions and concerns that Treasury raised. So there was a piece of trailer legislation, Senate Bill 943, that was also sent by the, House, uh, by the Senate and the House uh, was considering it. Uh, there was talk, uh, for those who read the blog, there was some talk of a veto override conversation that did not take place. Instead, uh, the House moved a piece of legislation that they put together and kind of gave to us at the last second uh, that would have changed the program completely and just created a new category of deferral and allowed each local unit to decide if they wanted to uh, offer this deferral, what documentation or criteria they were going to apply, uh, and whether they were going to and who they were going to approve and who they were going to deny. It was complete, uh, wide open. Um, community by community would have been different standards and different criteria and different uh, allowances in every community. We had a lot of concerns. We teamed up with the Township Association, the County Association, uh, school board, school administrators, community colleges, SEMCOG, you name it, across the board. I uh, kind of came out and said, whoa, this one, we've started this whole conversation with saying that 
if you're going to defer, you need to provide the funding for local units so there isn't a cash flow crunch. And two, you can't create this system that's going to have these open-ended uh, criteria and questions. We see too many, too many opportunities for uh, legal exposure for local governments under this. Lawsuits uh, right. coming right and left from someone who feels they should have gotten it or they got it in this community but didn't get it in this community right. or different requirements. So the Senate and opted not to take that that House proposal up uh, on its last day uh, last week. So uh, instead, were you surprised that they did that? That they didn't take it up? There was a lot of pressure, and I think a lot of questions that were valid. We brought up a lot of valid points, um, yeah. and then and there is a state budget impact from all this too. I mean, any you know, depending on the number of communities that would have offered deferrals, there's state education tax dollars that would have impacted current year collections for schools. So I think the state had an interest as well and a concern uh, from a cash flow standpoint. So. Okay. They've held off. The word we've gotten is this will be continue to be discussed between now and September when the legislature kind of does a lot more heavy lifting work in September when they come back. Um, and at that point, really see how many people are in need, how many delinquencies are there, how many people were not able to pay their summer bill, and then determine what the right approach is. So there'll be a lot more conversations on this, but for now, uh, the issue's on hold. Uh, nothing has changed. Uh, summer tax bills will continue to be collected as they're supposed to be collected. And I know one of the issues we had is with the first package that, you know, we had a couple months of testimony and it seemed like it was very thought through or this one was just introduced, voted on. It felt like it was kind of lame duck early almost for that one bill because everything was also like, ah, you know, with that one. So do you think that's kind of a, a prediction uh, for what's going to happen come November, December? <laughs> uh, fingers crossed, no. Um, <laughs> no, I... You never know what's going to happen in lame duck. You know, certainly you know, these are major elections. You know, the House is the only entity that's up. So you've got 100, 110 members of the House up. So depending on what happens there and the changes we see, I think that'll go determine a lot about what lame duck looks like. Sure, right. But yeah, stuff will hit fast and furious, no matter right. what. But you still have a Republican-controlled legislature and then a Democratic governor, so that's always that uh, right. relationship. All right. Uh, anything more on state stuff? I know we got some questions that come in. One couple were kind of long. Um, something about, uh, let's see, the, uh, there is a current summer property tax deferral allowed for townships and I think cities allows principal residences to defer to February 14th of next year. Um, is this still available or not for homeowners? Do we know anything about that one? I'm familiar with the senior deferral program. Um, Bob, give me a call on my cell and we can chat about this or send me an email and I can do some digging uh, or if we have any, any treasurers on, on the broadcast today. I said I'm familiar with the summer tax deferral. I know we had some issues with the PRE extension. There is a July board of review or was a July board of review extension for principal residence exemptions uh, for any of those folks who were caught uh, eventually caught back in March uh, and we're not able to get to the March board review for uh, for any questions and or anyone who was unable to get into a new constructed home before um, before the end of May so you know there were there were some questions around that um, you know but again I don't have any specifics uh, there were no there were no changes to any of the summer to existing summer tax deferral allowances there was the extension of the July Board of Review for, for principal residents. Um, so that's the, the biggest change that took place and that was done through some legislation and executive order. Okay, uh, another question. There was a statement in Executive Order 154 that says the order remains in effect during the state of emergency and for 28 days thereafter to the extent necessary to permit reliable scheduling of hearings and meetings. Does that mean we will be allowed to hold our public meetings virtually for 28 days after August 11th, even if she doesn't extend the deadline? Yeah, that, that answer is very simple, yes. Uh, it was okay. one of the things we had talked with the, the governor's office about. So in, in a hypothetical, say you had a meeting that was scheduled on August 12th, all of a sudden the emergency is not extended, You know, making sure that we can move forward and still have a productive meeting, even in that virtual format, was something that was important to us. So, so she was able to grant us uh, you know, that, that little bit of extra time, even if the emergency uh, at some point is no longer declared. So your August meetings should be good, but meetings after mid-September, you should probably start coming up with a plan B to meet in person possibly. I, 
I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, Matt. I, okay. I, I wouldn't only because as I had stated earlier, I, I do find every reason to believe right now that the emergency is going to be extended by or extended beyond August 11th. Again, not to, not to look too much into the crystal ball, but you know, just looking at the current situation and what's going on, I think it's very likely that it will be. Uh, but that 28 day extension should give our members plenty of time that should the emergency not be extended, which I'm sure at some point it won't be. Um, they will have that that four week period in which to, to plan and prep to make sure they can move away from the virtual format and back into uh, the in person format that we were accustomed to pre pandemic. Okay. All right, I'm going to jump around a little bit on the, the schedule here. We'll go back to the federal stuff, but I want to talk to Jen a little bit about uh, social uh, districts. Um, I know this has been a, a legislation that we've been, you know, advocating for. It's in place and some communities are doing it. Some communities are looking at it. What's the latest on this particular topic on social districts? Yep. So that was signed into law by the governor a few weeks back. It's PA 124. Um, we've been getting a lot of questions from folks who are looking into it about um, the, the size of their social district, you know, can the commons area be as big as the social district, can it encompass your entire downtown, um, all these questions you need to be consulting with your legal counsel on. Um, the law is one brand new. Um, and two, it's very vague. It's supposed to be as flexible as possible for locals to make um, if they're going to choose to do a social district, um, that it really works to fit, you know, what works best in your community. Um, a couple of things to pay attention to is if your community does opt in, um, passes the resolution establishing the social district, you need to send that to the Liquor Control Commission. Um, you also need to look at the definition of the commons area. Um, the, it was tweaked in the final, um, you know, when the bill was being finalized. Uh, it now says that it has to be the commons area, um, has to be contiguous to the premises of at least two other, other qualified licensees. Um, previously that said adjacent to, uh, and now contiguous. So I've gotten a lot of questions about, you know, what, what's the definition of contiguous? And right now, um, kind of the best answer we can give is that look in your zoning where you use contiguous um, and other requirements. And um, so that you're using that term uh, the same way in this, I guess. Um, we are going to be trying to get some clarification on that. We are in the process of setting up a webinar to talk about this, uh, have a municipal attorney participate, have the liquor control participate. Uh, the application for the social district permits, if you have any licensees that are asking you about this, it is up on the Liquor Control Commission's website. Um, and at the very top, you'll see if you go to um, the website, which we can put in, in the box chat box here, but if you look at it, uh, local government, the governing body is required to uh, approve that application before the applicant actually sends it in to the Liquor Control Commission to receive their permit. So those are a couple of steps you want to make sure you're aware of. Uh, you're also required if you set up a social district to um, put together a operations and maintenance plan uh, or management and maintenance plan, I believe is exactly what the law says, and send that to the commission. Um, the commission really doesn't have any say in your plan, um, but you are required to send it to them. A couple of other things just to keep in mind as you're discussing this with your council, the uh, social district was not meant to be just an open carry zone for alcohol. It was meant to establish a manageable commons area to help your establishments um, with their occupancy limits inside so that people could be outside and they're allowed to purchase the beverage in the establishment that has received the social district permit and then walk to the commons area and partake in drinking the beverage in the commons area. Once they're in the commons area, you cannot leave the commons area with the alcohol. Uh, you may be able to leave the cup because if it's a reusable cup versus say a styrofoam cup, there's specific requirements of the cup. It's got to have the establishment's logo. It's got to have a specific logo to your uh, social district or commons area. Um, that's for, you know, if you have bar A that's in, you know, community A and community B, they do not want that cup being able to be used in community A and community B. They want them specific to your commons area. So um, happy to try to answer any questions if anybody wants to reach out. But right now, because this is a new law, um, there's a lot of, there's not a lot of just 
it is X, it is Y. It's more um, as Tilties get up and running. Uh, the other thing to mention uh, real quick is that the Liquor Control Commission has absolutely no enforcement uh, once that beverage leaves the licensed establishment. It is on the locals to do any kind of police or enforcement when it comes to underage drinking, um, somebody over indulging out um, in the social district in the commons area, so. Right, thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Do, are we, do we have some members that are already, oh, my dogs are barking. Do we have some members already that are doing this and doing, do seem to have Definitely, success Yep, we have, not that I would say set up and ready to go. I think Grand Rapids is one of the more, um, they've been looking at this uh, in, in kind of trending as the, the law was being written and discussed. Um, and the city of Lansing um, is discussing tonight at their meeting of the Commission of the Whole meeting this evening they're talking about it so there's a number of communities um i know brighton um ted just said battle creek is set up and ready to go so there's a number of communities if folks are looking for others um to talk to um happy to reach out and and let reach out to me and i can let you know who some of those others are great that's helpful very much Okay, um, let's go to Harasana now and talk a little bit about uh, some of the environmental issues uh, that you're working on. I know uh, there's some new rules came out on the PFAS uh, situation. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure, Matt. So for most of us, we've been following the PFAS draft rules process for about a year now. So we're at the culmination of that process. Last week, the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules wrapped up their final session days. They had a total of 15 session days to review the rules. They then approved the rules, and so they've been sent over to be filed with the Secretary of State. And so the Secretary of State has approximately has seven days to file those rules. And so we're looking at approximately August 3rd is the day that we'll see those come come out. Um, but as we remember, when we first went into the pandemic, we just uh, had the rules released from the Environmental Rules Review Committee. Um, and there were some conversations about what will this look like long term, already discussions about how this will impact communities who will have to um, apply new technologies and new standards to accommodate um, their PFAS contamination in their water systems. And so for many communities, that could be a substantial cost. The numbers that we received from Eagle in a regulatory impact statement were not fully conclusive of how diverse our water systems are throughout the state. Um, there are very specific examples, and we have many communities already that we know spend several million of dollars several millions, excuse me, of dollars on PFAS. And so to say that the average cost is just six to 14 million wasn't exactly accurate. And so uh, last week in committee, we reaffirmed those concerns. And we also added that with COVID-19, there needs to be careful attention looking at how these funds, uh, how how this will be funded in the future, what grant funding looks like from the department. Uh, they mentioned earlier in the process that there will be grants available for communities who do need a financial assistance to comply with the rules. We want more clarity to know whether or not those funds are secure and available in a time of COVID. And so we affirm those concerns the same way as we shared them during the public comment period and uh, directly with the work group. And so those concerns were recognized by many members of the committee. Um, and the department has mentioned that they're going to do a little bit more work to look in and to affirm that we do have the funds necessary, especially on the grant funding side. Um, but there, I, we can look into the future and anticipate that there may be some legislation to go in and tighten up some of the things, some of the lack of clarity, especially for water systems uh, and how they have to adhere to these rules and implementation. And currently we're looking at approximately 22 systems that may be impacted by the new rule change. And so to go over wow. this again, we're looking at PFAS uh, compounds, about seven of them that have been identified in Michigan. And the lowest levels we're looking at are six parts per trillion and eight parts per trillion. And this is significantly lower from 70 parts per trillion where we were before. Um, right. And so moving forward, uh, testing will begin uh, in a tiered format. Those water systems that tested over the current MCLs now will be tested first, and then we'll continue until we're then testing the folks at the lowest levels. After a year of sampling and monitoring, then we will, then water systems will be told whether or not they're in compliance, and then the next steps to either continue annual testing or to continue quarterly testing to comply to these new rules. Okay. Well, good. Well, thank you. Um, and the other issue I know you're working on again is the high water levels of the Great Lakes and the, the shoreline communities. Uh, what's the latest on that topic? 
Yeah, I mean, so latest on that, we have been working with uh, partners at the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative, and they are a collection of mayors from both Canada and the United States along the Great Lakes Basin. Uh, they advocate for a wide diversity of water-related issues. Of course, high waters and shoreline erosion has become a priority issue to them. And they have initiated a campaign um, at the federal level in co collaboration with approximately 90 mayors along the Mississippi River, our main tributary in the country. Uh, and to request $20 billion from Congress for priorities of Great Lakes cities, including water infrastructure, coastal erosion, and also financial aids for city budgets impacted by COVID-19. Um, and so today we will be meeting along with some members of our Michigan communities with Senators Peters and Stabenow to discuss this idea, this plan that they have for their stimulus water restoration initiative, as it's called. Uh, and then why this is important and why we truly need to focus on infrastructure needs along the Great Lakes and also for our neighbors down the Mississippi River, why intervening at the Great Lakes Basin can be incredibly impactful for how they're able to respond uh, in the lower, lower parts of our country. So we're excited to have that conversation today and bring more awareness. And we're still going for that 40 million at the state level. You know, we'll still have to look at the revenue conference coming up this fall to see what that number will look like, but we've continued to affirm with both the governor's office and with Eagle that that 40 million is necessary. And at this point, we have tracked over $70 million in damages to municipal infrastructure. So the better we can be about building coalitions, not just throughout our state, but throughout the basin and across both countries impacted can help us secure the necessary funds we need and all at different angles. Right, and that dollar impact, uh, the number you came up with, that's something actually you started, you initiated, you've been tracking, you have an Excel document with all those listed. So if you know our shoreline communities you know, haven't given you that information, I would encourage them to do so, uh, but it's a pretty extensive list. So it's, it's very helpful to have that information as we go forward and try to get funding for our communities. All right, let's uh, jump back to the federal stuff and John. Um, uh, of course, uh, you know, a lot of talk about another stimulus package. Um, I heard different things. It might be days, it might be weeks. Uh, what are you looking at? Uh, what are you hearing from out of DC? Yeah, I wish I could tell you whether it was going to be days or weeks. Um, <laughs> but what I can tell you is that these, these coming days and likely, you know, the next two to three weeks are going to be some of the most important uh, weeks in DC for our members in, in the recent, in the recent past. I mean, we all know what our situation is, both with the state budget and our local budgets. Uh, and right now, the discussion coming out of D.C. and particularly out of the Senate and, and from Senate Republicans is talking about a package that would be a stimulus package that would be one trillion dollars and does not include aid to states and local governments. What it what it is likely proposing, and it's supposed to come out later today. Maybe it came out while we were we were doing this, um, it would provide more flexibility for the current CARES Act money that we have received. But as you heard Chris talk about earlier, almost all of that money has now been spent uh, by the state. And so some of that flexibility that the state would have, should they still have that in their bank account, so to speak, uh, may go away. And so we need to be very cautious uh, about the limited dollars that we've received already and the limited flexibility that we would have should they make that change. But again, this time is critical for you as our members and what we're doing as staff to weigh in with your uh, congressman or woman right now, because what we know is as of today, that money is not included in, in the rumored proposal by the Senate Republicans coming out of DC. What we also know is that 37 Senate Democrats signed a letter asking for the 375 million in local aid and the 500, uh, excuse me, 375 billion in local aid and 500 billion in state aid be included in any package. And so while we've talked a lot about targeting your Republican members of Congress, and that is still true, particular House members such as Molinar and Mitchell and Upton, Heisinga and Wahlberg, but right now we need to make sure we reach out to Senator Stabenow and step. Senator Peters. And the reason for that is because we know today that there will be a number of Republicans that will not vote for an aid package in the Senate simply because uh, they think that we've spent enough money and added to the deficit enough already. So it's going to require a bipartisan solution 
So making sure that Senator Peters and Senator Stabenow hear from us and that they stay strong on the letter that they just sent in terms of requesting that aid and making it part of the final Senate package will be exceptionally helpful. So, they, so were part of, uh, they were part of that 37? Those they were part of the 37. I verified that this morning. Um, and so, so while we know that they support it, the key is still that they hear it from us and understand how important it is. And so they feel as if they have the backing for all, from all those that are going to be impacted by this. Uh, and so they can continue to stay vigilant on that issue. The other things in, in this roughly $1 trillion package that, that is uh, rumored to be included is about $105 billion for schools as it relates to reopening. I already mentioned the flexibility around you know, the current CARES Act funding that's been distributed. Uh, there's talk of more direct payments to uh, individuals uh, and done in the same fashion as it was in, in the previous stimulus. And then there is some conversation around the extension of the unemployment benefits, but it might not include, and I say might not, right? Because again, the negotiation is still yet to happen. Uh, right now, there's some hesitation to put the $600 uh, a week uh, bonus into that. Um, we may see that scale back a little bit. You might see a direct extension. You might see no extension of it. Um, but again, those are all parts of the, the discussion right now, but again, that is, is primarily a $1 trillion package. And then the one sticking point, just so everybody knows, uh, on the Republican side, they've kind of let go of the, the payroll tax uh, reduction that the president has talked about, but Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is still talking very directly about liability protections uh, for both businesses and schools and, and others. And that's something that we're tracking very directly because each, each uh, caucus has kind of put their line in the sand. Um, we'll see how that shifts over the coming days. But again, I, I cannot emphasize enough how critical these next two weeks are and how important it will be for each of you to reach out and talk to those that represent you. Uh, and again, this time we have to target Senator Peters and Senator Stabenow as well as, as some of those in the House Republican caucus. Now, what, do you mean by what do you mean by liability protections? Yeah, so I mean, very simply, uh, you know, Senate Majority Leader McConnell doesn't want uh, businesses being sued if somebody contracts COVID while they're going through the reopening process. And so making uh, sure that, okay. that they protect them from lawsuits of that nature is, is a top priority of his and, and his caucus. And so you will see that as being one of the keys to getting a deal done on their end. And then obviously some of the keys coming out of the, the House Democratic Caucus in terms of unemployment insurance and, and obviously state and local aid as we've talked about. Okay, got it. Chris, and you it, wanted to say something? Man, yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, as we're talking with members today about making sure they're connecting with uh, their congressman or congresswoman, and senator, you know, it, important to remember some of those those key talking points. We hear a lot on the other side of, well, you know, there's the, the CARES Act money that came out was enough. Well, you know, as we talked about, State has now spent all of it. It hasn't necessarily gone out the door yet, but it's it's gone, and we haven't even gotten to develop a fiscal year 21 budget yet. There will be negative. The state's already, based on the the May revenue conference, estimating another three billion dollar deficit next year. There is no CARES money left to take care of next year's deficit. So there's, you know, if they if if you hear from your member of Congress, oh well, you know, we got to spend the current money first. Well, it's it's appropriated, it's gone. Uh, and it hasn't solved the budget that's coming, the budget problem that's coming. I think that is, you know, those are some real key things to remember uh, for members is that, yes, we need flexibility with the money that we have now, but, you know, it needs to be more direct aid to all local units of government. And it needs to, and it needs to be in addition, we need more of it because there is not enough to, to move us into the next year. We're done now with it. Yeah, Chris, I, I would I would agree with that. And the final thing that I will say in terms of you know sticking to the talking points that that we've discussed and some of the rhetoric that we hear out of Washington D.C. is that this is a bailout for our local communities. This is absolutely not a bailout. I mean, we've all been doing this long enough, both us here and and at the league and and you as our members, to know that the the talking point around mismanagement is an absolute falsehood. Uh, if anything, it's the disinvestment that we've seen in the state that has led to some of our problems, not the mismanagement of it. We've done a tremendous job of dealing with, with the issues that have been thrown at us uh, from the state level. And so 
you know, we really need to make sure we push back on that and push back on that hard to ensure that, you know, our members that represent us, that this is not a mismanagement issue, right? This is not an issue of, of whether or not we've spent the dollars that have been sent to us by the state or that we've collected in tax revenue have been, have been misspent. We're doing everything we can on the ground to provide safe water, right? To provide police and fire and do all those other things that our communities and our residents rely on. So make sure that, that we work that into anything that, that we discuss with those that you reach out to, because that's gonna be a really critical uh, talking point that we're gonna to need to push back against. Yes, for sure. Um, okay, I think that's all the topics that we hit on. Did I miss anything that anybody wants to jump in on before I uh, ask Betsy if there's any more questions? Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, going back to some of our early conversations on the budget, um, and the budget bill that passed last week. Two things that, that I want to make sure I, I mention as well, in addition to the, the August revenue sharing payment uh, elimination and swap, they did make two changes uh, that we worked with the legislature and the governor's office on for the existing money. So the, the 200 million of public safety and public health payroll and the um, hazard pay premium funding. There were two significant changes that we were able to get in. One dealing with authorities so if you're a community that's part of an authority, a fire authority, public safety authority, authorities will now, under the changes, as soon as the governor signs it, will be eligible uh, for both of those programs. Uh, additionally, if you were a community in Oakland, Wayne, Macomb, or Kent, and had been contracting for public safety services with the county, before now, the, you were ineligible to get anything because the county, those counties, since they'd received a direct allocation, were excluded from the bill. We've now allowed those counties to be included, but only to the extent that they are reimbursing you, the contracting community, for your payroll costs, so they can be, so they can get that money back. So there is an ability now for communities in Wayne, Oakland, Macomb, and Kent to receive some benefit from the public safety, public health payroll reimbursement. Those are two That's things again. Awesome as the bill gets signed, uh, we'll have more details coming out on that. Okay, good. All right, thank you. Um, Betsy, I'll ask you now if we have any other questions that, that I missed or didn't get to. Nope, you covered everything. Okay, thank you. So the other couple of things we have coming up this week is that um, public safety, future of public safety webinar. Uh, that is uh, 1230 on Thursday, July 30th. Our next Monday morning live will be not next Monday, but the weekend after we're going every other Monday in the summer uh, on August 10th. Uh, we'll hope to have either some state or maybe some federal officials in talking about the latest on the budget issues for that session. And we may even squeeze in an extra special Monday morning live, depending on what happens. If something big happens, we may have a special one. We'll, we'll, we'll be sure to let you guys know about that. And then on August 5th, I don't think it's even on our website yet, but uh, we are going to have the uh, webinar on the eviction for foreclosure prevention with uh, an official from MISHTA, Michigan State Housing Development Authority. So look forward to all those events. And of course, the big thing we're all working on uh, very hard uh, behind the scenes is our virtual convention. Uh, first time ever in the league's 121 year history. Uh, we're going to have to do a virtual convention. It's going to be the end of September, beginning of October on the same dates we would have been our normal convention was planned. And uh, there's going to be some exciting speakers. I believe, uh, I don't know if I'm even not allowed to say this, but I believe uh, there might be a top uh, legislative leader uh, speaking at our virtual convention. Um, so we've got some big speakers coming we're excited about. So again, thank you guys. And thank you everybody for joining us. Um, and uh, with that, we'll sign off. See you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.